Well, a pleasant good morning to everyone. Thank you for joining the Word is Working for Me broadcast. We thank God for this day. We thank God for the privilege and, and the, the grace to be able to bring the Word of God to you uh, Monday to Friday. If you're joining this broadcast and you're joining for the first time, please know that you're logged on, you're tuned in, you are sitting with the Word is Working for Me Network. And we broadcast Monday to Friday at 9 a.m. and on YouTube at 12 p.m. So thank you for joining. I have with me this morning Apostle Colin Esiboom. He is the founder and lead pastor of Breakthrough Ministries International. He is also uh, the founder and past lead pastor of Dominion Deliverance Ministries International, Dominion Deliverance Ministries New York. He's also the overseer and uh, pastor of many churches around the world globally, over a hundred churches. He is married to the amazing uh, Queen of Zamunda, Sister <laughs> Sharon Esiboom. Uh, father to four, to three boys and two wonderful grandchildren. He's also the spiritual father of many, many in the kingdom of God, of which I'm a part of the family. Apostle Essie Boom, it's an honor to have you here with us. You know, I like to do this every now and again without telling you. <laughs> so, um, uh, as we know, honor is the currency of the kingdom and this program is all about honoring the people of god as well so thank you for being here with us please help me welcome apostle in the chat if you have joined already please help me welcome him god bless you thank you for coming on apostle over to you do a little finger snap for the eminent and preeminent woman of uh the word is working for me She's looking fabulous, today, but short hair, long hair. She just knows how to wear it well. To God Ooh, be the good thank you. <laughs> that he has done. I gave a word a few weeks ago with regard to God blessing his people in the financial realm. And I thought uh, yesterday that it would be it would be prudent to remind God's children, because faith comes by hearing, not by what you have heard. And not all Christians have that ability to grab a hold of a word and to pray that word until it happens. Pray it in, pray it in. That we don't wait for prophecy, we war for prophecy, and we war with the prophecy that we have been given. Now, for the next couple of minutes, I'm going to make a few small statements on the subject of uh, financial handicap and everything else that goes with that. And then I'm going to pray before getting into my subject, I'm dealing with mentoring mentorship fatherhood and you need to pay keen attention because i have some points that are salient points Amen. it's a stuff that is near and dear to my heart so you know i'm going to have some revelation on that subject matter but let's deal with finances i remember telling you that i saw a hand with a chunk of u.s currency handing it to somebody who was nonchalant laser fear lackadaisical and the hand received it. It did not recede with, without the person taking the money from it. It receded and it receded with the money in, in its hand. So I asked the Lord, what, what, you know, what does that mean? He said, a lot of my people are like that. When blessings come, it's almost like they don't think that they have the right to be blessed in that strong manner. So they are tentative, they're hesitant. And he who hesitates loses his blessing. And so I know that across the globe, the times are tighter, the times are harder because the same amount of money you used to buy grocery with, now you need to do a half, time and a half, double of what you used to do. The grocery is less. So everybody is under that financial pinch. And whenever people get pinched, the first thing that goes is giving to God. It's a sad thing that people lose out on their faith in God when he's the one that they can lean on the most and get the most benefits out of it. So number one, when you are desiring 
financial breakthrough, when you're desiring it, like, like we desire it now. Number two, when you are tired of financial embarrassment, you're constantly behind in your bills, or you put your card in there and the machine says, not sufficient funds. I can't stand that one. <laughs> NSF, NSF, not sufficient funds. <laughs> Number three, we are praying to break financial bondage. We are praying to break financial bondage because in your financial experience, it's the same old, same old. Nothing has changed radically. It's just the same thing, and it's been happening for days, months, years, and decades. Number four, we want to arrest the spirit of the leaking pockets. What do you mean by leaking pockets? You don't know where your money goes. You don't know where your money went. You know you had a lot of money. You know you didn't buy much of anything. And you look around and the money is gone. The money is funny. Now, let me say this and say this strong. One of the strategies of the enemy is to plague us with financial handicap in order to paralyze our potential. And we have got to resist by taking on the whole armor of God and waging a war against it. The second major cause of financial handicap is giving to God stingily, sparingly. This is plainly stated in the scripture. He that soweth sparingly shall reap sparingly. Second Corinthians 9 and 6. So between the enemy's strategy to plague us with financial handicap to paralyze our potential and our a lack of ability to give generously to God, those two things are the major reason behind financial insufficiency and lack. And having acknowledged them, we are going to pray in this manner. I'm praying now for victory in the area of your finances and mine. In the name of Jesus Christ, we come to God and pray that all demonic hindrances to our prosperity, that demonic hindrances will be totally paralyzed. Let the satanic banks that are withholding and holding my finances, let them let it go. The strong man that's holding my finance captive, the strong mm -hmm. man that's preventing others from obeying God in terms of giving and receiving, the strong man that has been fighting my financial life from the day I got saved to now, I bind that strong man in the name of Jesus. And I declare that I will possess all of my possessions. I will possess all of my possessions. I possess all of my possessions. No one has it. I break and loose myself from every curse of financial bondage and from the spirit of poverty. I release myself from every conscious and unconscious covenant with the spirit of poverty. I release myself from every conscious and unconscious covenant, hey, 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 with the spirit of poverty in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Let God arise and let every enemy of my financial breakthrough, let them be scattered. Let them be scattered. Let the enemies of my financial breakthrough be scattered and let God arise in my life and bring blessings that overflow, blessings that come in abundance, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, men giving into my bosom. Glory to God. Lord, restore all of my wasted years, my wasted efforts, and convert them into blessings. Restore my wasted years, restore my wasted efforts and convert them, my wasted years and wasted efforts, convert them into blessing, convert them into blessing. Let me experience a season of restoration by the hand of God, the sevenfold restoration, hey, 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 to the glory of God in the name of Jesus. Let the spirit of favor be upon me. Put your right hand on your head as we pray. Let the spirit of favor be upon me everywhere I go. And let it be upon me concerning my finances. Let the spirit of favor rest mightily upon me concerning my finances everywhere I go. No matter where I go, let the favor and financial blessings come upon me and stay upon me in the name of Jesus. Concerning finances, let the favor of God come upon me and stay upon me everywhere I go. That I will not experience the desert spirit. I will not experience the snail spirit. I will not experience the slot spirit. I will not experience the leaking pocket in the name of Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I ask in the name of Jesus that you would send your ministering spirits to bring prosperity and funds into my finances. Send your ministering spirits who are angels to bring prosperity and to bring funds 
into my finances in the name of Jesus. Let men bless me anywhere I go. Let men bless me everywhere I go. I release my finances from the clutches of financial hunger, the financial hunger that eats it up. I release my funds. I release my money. I release my finances from the clutches of the spirit of hunger that comes every time I have and eats it up. That comes every time I have with a lying story about something going wrong in the family and they're able to use my emotional response to get funds away from me when it should have remained. Hey, 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 hey. I will not be deceived by lying stories ever again. I lose angels in the mighty name of Jesus to go and create favor in my financial life. I lose angels. Yes, I release angels in the mighty name of Jesus to go forth and to create favor for my finances because angels are sent as ministering spirits for us who are the heirs of salvation. Oh yes, let God arise and the enemy be scattered. Let financial hindrances be removed. Let them be removed. Let financial hindrances be removed. Let them be removed. Let them be removed. Them be removed. Move them out of my life. Move them out of my circumstances. Move them out of my bills. Move them out of my checkbook. Move them out. Move them out. Move them out. In Jesus' mighty name, I have prayed. And let the favor of God in matters of finances start coming to me. Let them come rushing like the waves of the sea, one after the next, one after the next, one after the next, after the next. Let me experience financial blessings in a way I have never, ever experienced it before to the glory of God. And I agree to give you the glory in Jesus' mighty name. Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen. All right. Thank you very much. Be, say with me as you lift up your right hand, I believe and I receive in the name of Jesus. I believe and I receive in the name of Jesus. One more time. I believe and I receive in the name of Jesus. In Proverbs 4, 10 to 13, Proverbs 4, 11 to 14, it says words to this effect. Where no counsel is, no advice is, no advisor is, the people fall, they fail. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Mentors are teachers of wisdom. And they will enter and exit your life at different points in time. The Holy Spirit is going to be your best mentor. Because wisdom will determine the success of your life. Write that down. Wisdom will determine the success of your life. There are three ways to receive wisdom. Number one, you receive wisdom by instruction or by schooling. Number two, you receive wisdom by <laughs> mistakes that you make, the school of hard knocks. And number three, you receive wisdom by mentors. Mentors are the difference many times between poverty and prosperity, between decrease and increase between loss and gain, between pain and pleasure, between deterioration and restoration. In the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Now here are some things that you need to know about a mentor. That's why you need one. And some of you aren't to know you, you don't have one because you don't like instruction, you don't like advice, you don't like to be told anything, and you have been hitting your face against the wall, busting your teeth, busting your lip all over the place, and it's a recurring decimal of the school of hard knocks that you have passed through and you're not getting any younger. It's time to get a mentor in your life because like I love to say, mentorship is accelerated wisdom. In Proverbs 4 and 7, the Bible says, wisdom is the principal thing. And so a mentor is the master key to the success of a protege. Wisdom is the principal thing. And the mentor has the wisdom that you need to get you across the hump. Number two, a mentor can transfer wisdom to you through relationship and cause you to learn in five months what took them 25 years to get. Proverbs 13 and 20 says, he that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Joshua was aware of this. The Bible says, and Joshua, the son of Nun, had the spirit of wisdom upon him, why? Because Moses had laid his hands upon him, Deuteronomy 34 and verse 9. 
Only because of the relationship and the laying on of hands by Moses, Joshua received the spirit of wisdom because, or why? Why did he receive the spirit of wisdom? Moses laid his hands on him. There was a transfer of what was on Moses into Joshua. What does that mean? A mentor can transfer in a moment what you can't get in years of toil. And you get faster to your destination because of mentorship. Number three, a mentor guarantees your promotion. Proverbs 4 and 8 says, exalt wisdom and she shall promote thee and bring thee to honor. When thou dost embrace her, she shall give to thine head an ornament of grace, a crown of glory shall she deliver to thee. Wisdom will deliver it to thee. The mentor shall deliver it to you. They will exalt you and promote you and bring you to honor when you embrace the wisdom that's coming out of their mouths. It's hard to get people to embrace the wisdom of God because of the times in which we live. Number four, a mentor can determine your wealth. Proverbs 8 and 18 says, riches and honor are with you, yea, durable riches and righteousness. Number five, a mentor, this is one of the things I like, a mentor can paralyze your enemies that come up to fight against you. In other words, you don't even have to fight. They will take on the fight. No, 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 no. Hold a minute. Hold a minute. Who did you say you're talking about? Well, you can't talk about them like that because I am here. In Luke 21, 15, the Bible says, I will give you a mouth, a mouth of wisdom, which your adversary shall not be able to gainsay, nor resist. Your mentor will take on your adversary and paralyze them so that they can't get to you. They are your shield. A mentor is a shield from the attacks of those that are trying to take you out before you come into your glory. The next thing is Deuteronomy 34 and 9. A mentor can cause influential people to pay attention to you. When indeed and in fact, there is nothing that you have done really that should get that kind of attention and get that kind of audience to listen to you. Look at what it says here, Deuteronomy 34 and 9. And Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands upon him, and the children of Israel hearkened unto him. They listened to him. They paid attention to do what he said because they knew that he had the wisdom of Moses on him. They recognized, they saw in him what was on Moses. In the same way, the sons of the prophets, Raku Masakasham. Hey, mm. it's going to be a good day, man. I'm getting both a fight and an anointing <laughs> at the same time. Mm. It's all trying, to, like something is trying to lock it down. And at the same time, I'm getting that touch, that energizer battery, that energizer mm. bunny. That rock of shocker. And I'm going to yield myself to the anointing of God today. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. A mentor can cause influential people to listen to you. The children of Israel listened to Joshua because Moses had laid his hands on him. And they saw the wisdom of Moses in Joshua. And they listened to him. They, the whole nation, millions of people listened to him because Moses had laid his hands on him. The sons of the prophets, when they saw the river Jordan parting hither and thither, you know what they said? Listen to what they said. The spirit of Elijah is resting on Elisha. They saw that what Elijah had, Elisha had, and whatever Elisha told them to do, they listened and paid attention to him, except when he told them, don't go looking for the prophet, he's gone. They went and searched until they were frustrated. Glory to God. Now here is your response with regard to the mentor. A mentor will require your pursuit. <clears throat> he does not need what you know, but you need what he, he knows or she knows. Elijah never went after Elisha. Elisha desired what was in Elijah. And the proof of desire, now hear me and hear me strong, the proof of desire is pursuit. Don't tell me you desire what I got, but you're not paying any attention. You, you're missing for months and months and months. I barely see you on again, off again. If I don't send you the message, you don't listen to it. And even when I send it to you, you don't respond. I had to cut off one person out of my life because I keep sending them stuff and they wouldn't even look at it. And I told them face to face, you know, you don't, you don't seem to care about the good stuff. 
And after a while, I stopped sending them my stuff. But when I saw good things around, I would send it to them still with the hope that they would watch and, and get something from it. They wouldn't watch it. And so that investment of searching out for quality material to send to them was a precious waste of time because they were not accessing it. And so I decided to stop. And then they had the nerve to tell me, I'm not seeing anything fresh from you. Well, guess why? Wow. <laughs> guess why? I've been sending you stuff for years and you don't look at it. All of a sudden you're paying attention now. The devil and his mother-in-law is a liar. Mentorship, the proof of desire, the proof that Elisha wanted what was on Elijah. When the sons of the prophet stayed at Bethel and Gilgal and Jordan, the prophet Elisha went on, went on, went on. And sometimes the mentor will look like they don't want nothing to do with you. He told him, Elijah told Elisha, stay here with these jokers. Of course, he didn't call them jokers. And Elisha said, no, I want something that's on you. And I'm not staying here with these jokers. The proof of desire is pursuit. You got to pursue your mentor and draw out of him or her what is inside of them. Because a mentor is more interested in your, in your success. Hear this part that you're not going to like. A mentor is more interested in your success <clears throat> than in your affection. They want to see you succeed. And sometimes they're going to hurt you, tell you things you don't want to hear, just so that you can succeed. They want you to succeed. They look over your stuff. If they see any, any uh, smartphone errors there, they'll, they'll tell you, look, this thing is not right. Change that thing. That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Why? They want you to succeed, and they want other people to look at you, and they must feel good looking at you. They must say, oh, this dunce, yeah. look at the road here. And so they're trying to cover and protect you from all those criticism. They don't like when you're criticized. They like when you're praised. They say, yeah, that's, that's my girl right there. That's my boy. That's my man. That's my dog. They want you to win. They want you to succeed. More than anything else, they want to see you become all that you were born. Hey, 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 hey. Their focus is not, on, not the celebration of you, but the correction of you. It seems like they're only finding fault with you. They don't do that to nobody else. I have a friend out there that's a, an apostle as well. And boy, they make a thousand blunders in, in, in four lines of writing. The spelling is awful. They, 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 it's, all, it's all a mess. But guess what? I don't say queer. <laughs> I read wow. every single day and I shake my head and say to myself, my God, have mercy. And this person is gifted in terms of revelation. They got that. God shows them stuff. But I don't feel the need to, um, to flow in that, in that river. <laughs> mm. They're going to try with that. Somebody else will take on that, that job and get that done. Your mentor is not necessarily your best friend. Your friends, they love you as you are. They love you where you are. But the mentor loves you too much to leave you where you are. Your friends are comfortable with your past. Your mentor is comfortable with your future. The mentor is always seeing ahead, seeing ahead, seeing ahead. What can this person become? What can this person become? What can this person become? And they're constantly tweaking your antenna to get you to the future that they see. Your friends ignore your weakness. Your mentor, they want to remove that weakness out of your life because they know down the road, the enemy is setting you up for some massive blow. Your friends are your cheerleader, but your mentors, they are your coach. They're not there to cheer you on. They are there to point as to how you can win. Uh, Mike Tyson, the heavyweight champion of the world, he had a, a trainer, a coach, a white guy that used to shout from the ringside, number three, number six, number nine. Now, three, six, and nine were different blows, straight mm -hmm. right, left cross. And they had so worked together for so long that Tyson knew when he heard number three, what blow to throw. He does not see that the man is open for a number three shot, but the coach does. And he would shout from the sideline, number three. All of a sudden, Tyson would rock back and let go a blow. And the man's head or jaw was always right there to receive it. And nine times out of 10, he would get knocked out. And mm. then I heard that they had some altercation and Tyson fired the man. And I told some friends of mine, Tyson is going to begin to lose from now. 
because that extra pair of eyes he doesn't have. He's young, he's wild, he's full of himself. And where go at pride, there come at destruction. And so said, That's right. so in Tokyo, he was drunk. He was drinking the night before. He was partying with women. He was carrying on. And he had Buster Douglas, whose mother was sick and dying in the hospital, saw a fight with Tyson and told her son, Buster, said, Buster, he is made for you. He is built for you. Knock him out, my son. You can knock him out. Don't come back to this hospital unless you knock him out. And his mother was going to die before that fight. And so in memory of his mom, he decided that on that night in Tokyo, Japan, he was going to mash up Iron Mike. And he did exactly what his mama said. He knocked Tyson out. The mentor his mother, saw that Tyson could be beaten and told her son to knock him out. Your mentor is your coach. Your friends see what you do right. The mentor sees what you do wrong. A mentor will see things you cannot see. Number three, number six, number nine. The man saw the weaknesses before Tyson could see it. And a mentor will see the weaknesses in you before you can experience the pain of that weakness. He sees an enemy before you can discern them. He has already experienced the pain of a problem that you are about to create. And so he stops you from creating that problem. In the African tradition, correction upward is seen as rebellion. In the African tradition, correction upward, no matter how well-meaning, it's seen as rebellion. How dare you correct an elder? So knowing you. that, stop people from correcting an elder. That's Just right. let bygone right. challenge it. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Thank God, thank God for people that listen anyhow. And most people say, ah, come on, uh, we are friends. I'm going to tell them what I know. Mm -hmm. One of the lessons of mentorship is your mentor will become an enemy to your enemies, those who are your enemies. Jesus said, Simon, Simon, Luke 22, 31. Satan has desired to save you as wheat, but I have prayed for you. I took action to stop him, to beat him before he can get to you. Oh, glory to God. Glory to God. All right, we talked about the mentor. Let's talk about the mentee. Let's talk about the protege. Let's talk about the person who is learning and we are all learning in different stages of our life. A protege is an enthusiastic learner. <laughs> enthusiastic qualifies what, what to look for. If there's no enthusiasm there, well, you know that this person is not too interested. The wisdom of the mentor is perpetuated through the protege, through the protege. Jesus took 12 learners and revolutionize the world with them. It is important to recognize that those who are connected to us by the Holy Spirit, we are connected for multiplying and perpetuating their success and the principles, the salient points that they give. One of the things that you do as a teacher is to learn, as a teacher, you learn that you only remember what you teach. Say what? A teacher only remembers what they teach. And so you've got to learn and teach. They are protégés, learners who are passive. They sit down, and if you don't feed them, feed them, they don't take nothing. They don't uh, go after it. But passive protégés, they only reach. They only reach for you when it is convenient or when their personal efforts do not pro uh, uh, produce their desired result. They only reach when it is convenient, when they're in the right mood and, and they, they catch you in the right mood, yeah, yeah, yeah or when their personal efforts do not produce the desired result that they were looking for. That's when they reach for you. So let me call this guy and see what he says. They subconsciously expect the mentor to produce the success for them and not to feel the pain of going after it. Now, there are some uh, uh, protégés, mentees, that are parasitic. They are parasitic. They pursue the mentor for his credibility, for her credibility, not for correction. They don't want to be corrected at all. They want the notoriety that you have. The word is working for me. Wow, she's got a program on there. People are watching every day. Let me see if I can hook up with her and steal some of her audience. I had somebody who was on my page, and they were searching out for all of the people that look well-to-do, and then calling them up and stinging them for money, and they got through it with sums that would stagger your imagination 
And there I was having those people and I wasn't going after them for anything. And this rascal was succeeding at milking the cow. They were parasite protégés. They pursue not for correction. They want to use your name and your influence. They want to manipulate others into a relationship because they claim you as the person that they are out for, when indeed, in fact, what they are out for is themselves. They want what you have earned, but they don't want what you have learned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They want your reputation okay. preparation. They don't want to prepare. They don't want to study to show themselves to prove unto God. But they want to be on the same audience, the same platform with you. They want your audience and they want your platform. And they will do whatever it takes, including lie, to get there. Yes, yes. So there's a parasite protege. There's a, there's a passive protege. There's the prodigal protege. Th th these prodigals are those that enter and exit freely. They come, they go. They come when they feel like they need something, they go. When serious correction occurs, they move towards another mentor who has not yet discovered their flaws. They distance themselves from you when they encounter personal difficulty. If you lose credibility or if someone accuses you of something, it may be a false accusation or some persecution that has arisen, they only return when their pig pen becomes unbearable. They only return to you when their pig pen becomes unbearable. There are some people, when I see them on my page, I know they're smelling the pig pen, they're out of cash that they got from the father's house. They have nothing to spend. They are broke spiritually and other lease. And they come to see they get something else that can sustain them for a bit. <laughs> These are the prodigals. They come and go, come and go. They don't stand with you in your rough time. They don't stand with you when rumors are spreading. They run. It's a valuable lesson I learned one time. I got, I got some... Uh, some verbal abuse at a public event and all around me were standing people that i thought were friends of mine and not one of them spoke up i turned and i looked at them and i shook my head and walked away got into my car and drove off sometimes a public scandal can show you who is in your corner and who is not But then there's the productive mentee, the productive one. Oh, thank God for them. They make your, mm. they make your mentoring worthwhile. They make you know that it's not all loss. And the good thing about it is the one that wins, they win so big, they make up for all the others that lost. <laughs> <laughs> and you know they're a winner. Yeah. You know that this, this mentee that you got is a winner. Everybody wants to be called their mentor. <laughs> yeah. Everybody wants to be associated with them. Everybody's calling their name. You want to hold a minute, hold a minute, hold a minute. I was in a service one time and this lady stood up. She was a pastor, well meaning lady, nice lady. And she picked out a certain guy and, and told everybody in the audience, there were like 200 people in there and more. And she said, This is my son. I brought him up when he was young and uh, I am his mentor. And, and the guy was smiling and he was looking at me because he just met her the other day. <laughs> I knew him when he was five, <laughs> from five. He lived with us at one time, all through stages in school. We would make sure that he got to school, got something to eat got money to spend, and we were taking care of business, making sure that he stayed in church, looking out for him all this time, and he became a, a smashing success, I mean to tell you. And everybody was claiming him as their son. He's my son in the Lord. I'm looking and say, well, to my God, where, what am I, chop liver? Mm. But I, I learned a valuable lesson that day that it does pay off. And when it pays off, here comes these people, and everybody's laying claim on them trying to put their yeah. brand on them, trying to put their stamp on them, trying to say, you know, when I met them, they were nothing, and I turned them into something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, glory! glory to God. Wow. This is the productive protege, the productive mentee. These are rare, special, and it's doable to get yourself one. They have a servant's heart. That's the first thing. 
They have a servant's heart. They will put you out there and make you look so good. People think, I joined your program today on Facebook Live because I saw the flyer. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a rev, you're really putting up some good flyers. And I said, yes. Yeah. <laughs> After a while, I got so shame. I told them, I said, look, man, it's not me doing that. It's somebody else doing all that. Them flyers that you see is not me. They said, wow, how much you pay? I said, you, you wouldn't want to know that either. Because I want them to pay the same price. <laughs> you, you, <laughs> I'm enjoying myself today. You, you pay with a, mentoring. They have a servant side. That's a good thing. They have a they serve without without making themselves a brick in a shoe. They're not calling attention to themselves. They just want to do it to, to make you look good. Yeah, to make you yes. the star. And they take yes. the supporting role. You gotta watch these mentees that when you have the big stage and you're walking the red carpet, there they are in front of you posing, getting the pictures too. It's my moment to shine. Mm -hmm. Brother, yes. his moment. Don't be, you know, don't be jealous of people's red carpet moment because yours is coming. One thing people don't realize, and I'm gonna say it and say it loud, this is my most salient of salient points. Wherever I go, my mentee goes. That's right. As soon as the door is open for them to go, or sometimes the door is open for me and I say, I, I don't want to go, but I got this person here and you need to hear them. They are the cats meow and the dogs bow wow. And people will listen to me because if I say that's what they are, that's what they are. They don't even have to know them. They will rep. If you recommend them, we know you, we know you don't play. And so if, they got to be good for you to recommend them this highly. Yes, I said, they're gooder than what you're thinking there. And mm -hmm. never fail. They always tell me when I hear back to say, man, uh, you're going you're gonna to have to sing for your supper now because now that we know them, we are wondering if we want you back. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> oh, glory to God, because they're younger than you and they're prettier than you, Rev. You got to believe that. I said, oh, all right, all right. Don't let's go there. Don't let's go there. Let's not, let's not bother to go there. In in First Thessalonians five, Marcos another. Okay. In First Thessalonians five, verse twelve and thirteen, the book says, "We beseech thee, brethren, to know them that labor among you and are over you in the Lord, and admonish you. And this is what you must do: esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, because of what they do. Esteem them not just highly, very highly. How?" in love esteem them in love for the works that they do for the sake of the work for the thing that they are doing in the kingdom of god because of what they're doing to promote the kingdom of god esteem yeah. them consider them worthy of double honor another scripture says so uh mentorship is not something that's passive being a mentee is not something that's passive it's something that's active it's something that's proactive it's a doing thing I said, oh, that's my mentor over there. And they only say that when the person is dead. I was shocked at how many people claim Dr. Miles Monroe as their mentor when he died. But when he was alive, they wouldn't even buy the man's book. They wouldn't even buy his book. Mm -hmm. I told him, you know, he came to World Vision and ministered. He said, what? He went to your church? I said, yes, he went there. I wasn't there, but he went there. You know, I got his last book. What is his last book? I didn't know he got that book. Oh, he's got more than 40 books. What? Yes. I never knew he had so many books. Yes. You know, I went to this conference at the Flamingo Hotel where James Bond did his movie. You went to Bahamas? Yes. You know, we used to close down our services when he came here to Canada after he got his own jet. You used to close down church to go hear him and carry the church with you, Rev? Yes. Yes. And then they start backing off. They don't want to call themselves his, his, his mentees anymore because they hadn't done any of the above. They didn't even buy his book. How can someone be your mentor? You have nothing to do with them. But after they die and you know that they have got this good name out there, you're trying to align yourself with them. Sometimes a mentor has to die for people to realize that God had called them to be under that person's tutelage. God have mercy on us. We beg you to know them that labor among you. We beg you to know them that are over you. Over you meaning they got more maturity in terms of the gospel than you. And admonish you. They constantly are there telling you, encouraging you, telling you, rebuking you, whatever, 
to get you to where you have to get to and to esteem them very highly in love. All right. Now, here's some facts about the protege that you need to know. The protege will invest to stay in the presence of the mentor. In Ruth chapter 1, verse 16, Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die. I'm not leaving. Or pro went back. Ruth refused to go. The prodigy will invest to stay in the presence of the mentor. I'm not going anywhere. You're not chasing me. Because many times the mentor will, will, will test to see the loyalty in the sense. You know, you don't need to be, you don't need to, you know, you know, you don't need to have me around. You got other people that are better than me. Hey, like it, industrial velcro. <laughs> industrial velcro got a grip that doesn't doesn't let go. <laughs> the second thing is so the, the mentee will stay in the presence of the mentor. And when the mentor seemed to want to get rid of them, Ruth said, Don't talk about me leaving you. With that subject is off limits. We're not gonna talk about that again. This is the last time I want to hear about that. I don't want to hear about that again. I'm not going anywhere. So let's talk about something else. Number two, they follow the counsel of the mentor. In Deuteronomy 17, 12, and 13, write this scripture down. Deuteronomy 17, 12, and 13. And the man that will do presumptuously and will not hearken unto the priest he wouldn't listen to instruction. He wouldn't listen to advice. That standeth to minister before the Lord thy God or unto the judge, even that man shall die. And thou shalt put away the evil from Israel. It is evil to not listen to good advice, to good counsel, to godly advice. And all the people shall hear and fear and do no more presumptuously because the Lord will kill the presumptuous person who has an instruction from a priest or from a judge and they don't listen to the advice. They are doing presumptuously. The Lord was wanting the people to follow the counsel of the mentor, to follow the counsel of the leaders that he had established. And some people were presumptuous. They were staring in the face and said, you know, I'm just like you. What you know, I know. What gift you have, I have the same gift. There was this law of equivalence. We are all the same. And we all do the same work, and you're not greater than me. And to that, I always answer, they are guns, and they are guns. And they are guns. They are guns, and they are guns. We, we all don't do the same work. Where I fit, you can't fit. Where you fit, I can't fit. I acknowledge your greatness, that you can get into areas I can't. And I also acknowledge that when the walls of containment and confinement stand in the way, that I am the best man for that job. I have the decimating anointing. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, with ruthless aggression, I will take out every wall of containment. Now, here's the other thing. The mentee will reveal the secrets and their dreams to the mentor. Ruth said to Naomi, I ain't going nowhere. I'm staying with you. I'm going to get a husband among your people. I'm going to marry him and get some grandchildren. That will bring glory to God. Elisha expressed his longing to Elijah. Vulnerability creates the unbreakable bond. Vulnerability creates the unbreakable bond between the mentor and the protege. When David was in trouble, he ran to Samuel. And the prophet told him what to do with regard to Saul. They will reveal their secrets and the dreams in their heart. Elisha told Elijah, I want a double portion of what is on you. I'm not following you for nothing. There is something that I want in return for all this service that I'm giving. Something is on you and I want it. Glory to God. Glory to God. Mm -hmm. Number four. The mentee will discuss their mistakes and their pain with the mentor. In 1 Samuel 19 and 18, so David fled and escaped and came to Samuel to Ramah and told him all that Saul had done to him. And he and Samuel went and dwelt in Naoth. It's another place. The protege will discuss his mistakes and his pain with the mentor. David was hurting. 
There was no one else to talk to. He went to Rama to find Samuel the prophet. Don't be afraid to share the pain. Everybody has pain. And I've got a PhD, several PhDs in pain. I am Dr. Pain. So anything to do with pain, I know how to handle it because been there, done that, got the t-shirt, spent a week at the hotel. Mm. Five. The protege will define clearly their expectations to the mentor. Elisha said to Elijah, I want a double portion. Ruth explained her desire to Naomi. David explained his desire to Samuel. Joshua explained his desire to Moses. Peter explained his desire to Jesus. He said, oh, don't, well, wash my head and wash my whole body also. Peter was something else. Hmm. They clearly define their expectation. This is what I expect of you. David explained to the 400 men at Adulam, when I get done with you, you will all be right-handed and left-handed. When I get done with you, you will take out a lion in a pit in winter. When I get done with you, you will hunt down Goliath's other four brothers. When I get done with you, one of you in a battle can change the complexion of that battle. When I get done with you, you will take a spear and kill 800 men for your beans and lentils that you plant. And nobody's going to be able to take them away. But when I get done with you, you will be known as mighty men in terms of any battle because you will learn to fight like me, to move like me to shoot an arrow like me, to throw a spear like me, to wield a sword like me, to fight with a knife like me. And when there is no knife, no arrow, no bow, no sword, no javelin, hand to hand, bare knuckle, you will learn to strangle a bear like me with your bare hands and tear a lion's mouth open like me, you will become me. Mentorship is about duplicating yourself in the life of the other person. Amen. To the point where people hear them and, and hear you when they hear them say, okay, all right. There are times I hear some African preachers and I'm hearing miles. I'm hearing miles. No matter how they try to polish it, I'm hearing miles. There he goes again. There he goes again. The reach and impact of that man cannot be quantified. Cannot be quantified. You hear him while they're talking, while they're preaching, while they're ministering. Because his flavor, his seasoning has so worked in them that they can't help but give out a taste of the flavor, a smell, a whiff, an aroma of the flavor of Dr. Monroe. Are you feeling a brother now? Yes, amen. The mistakes and their pain, they will define clearly their expectation. They will gladly sow seeds of appreciation back into the life of the mentor. In 1 Kings 10, 2, 3, and 10, and she came to Jerusalem, the queen of Sheba, with a very great train, with camels that bear spices and very much gold and precious stone. And when she was come to Solomon, she communed with him all that was in her heart. And Solomon told her all her questions. And that not one thing hid he, the king, from her, which he told her not. And she gave the king 120 talents of gold and spices of great store and precious stone. What a remarkable <clears throat> blessing Solomon got from the Queen of Sheba. You have an agenda to bless the people in Dominica, and she says, I'll give a thousand. Woo! <laughs> 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 Glory to God. Wow. You know, you don't see these things, but I look for them. And I see them. I see them. They don't know I'm seeing them, but I'm seeing them. And then there are those who talk a good game. <laughs> mm. uh, they talk a good game. They talk a good game. Like the guy who's telling me, oh, I, I'm going to be a part of your class. And he doesn't join the class. But two weeks later, he has his own class. And he's charging the same. He's charging more money for three weeks than I charge for six months. I'm on now. What a thing, what a thing, what a thing. Look for stuff like that. In other words, what that person is saying, the idea is a brilliant idea. So it's a backhand compliment, really. What they're saying is, this is what should be done. This is a, a, another way of getting the gospel out, as well as getting some remuneration into the hands of, of them that are digging out all these nuggets and giving it to us 
for, for a ridiculously low price for an extended period of time. They are overworked and underpaid and undermined on the job. And it is, it is to our advantage that we learn the stuff that they got. Mm -hmm. Yes. But they want it for free. Look, when the five virgins were about to go to the wedding, the other five came to them and said, give us some of your oil. And they said, if we give you, we won't have enough to go through the wedding. Go and buy. Now, the fact that they told them to go and buy means that they were aware that the foolish had money. They were foolish, but they had their lamps. They had oil, though they didn't have sufficient. And they had money to buy oil. Let me make my point again. They were foolish, but they had money to buy oil. They just didn't take the time to go get what should have given them light when the darkness really did hit. Now, the other point to be made there is that half of the church is foolish. So half of the people that you meet in the kingdom are going to be foolish people. Now, the question becomes, what, what wow. made the wise wise? There are two things that made the wise wise. Number one, they carried sufficient oil. And here's the, here's the clincher. <laughs> Number two, what made the wise wise was their ability to say no. To the fool. And what made the fools fools was that they wanted the oil for free. Ooh, come on now. <laughs> Let me buy that thing up now. Foolishness is wanting for free oil that can sustain you through the night of darkness. You know you need it. But the only way you want to get it is to get it for free. Everybody, anybody who wants free teaching, free preaching, and all they want to do is press like they're a fool. Or you can't say that, Rev. I ain't saying that. The scripture is saying that. Fools want for free what they have the money to pay for. Fools always try to get it as cheap as possible, as easy as possible, or for free. There are people that will weary you out with, with platitudinous ponderosity, sweet talk, nice word. Oh, Rev, that message was a blessing to me. <laughs> but they don't see the need to bless what blessed them. Fools are people who have the money to pay for the oil, but want it for free. Anybody that you see only wants free, that person is labeled a fool. The wise were wise because they knew when to say no. They knew when to send the fool to go buy oil. The Bible says, buy the truth and sell it not. Oh, that can preach, but I'm not going to preach. I'm, I'm about to close. I'm about to close. The protege will ultimately receive the mantle of the mentor. Everything that's flowing in the mentor will flow in them. There is what you call a transference of anointing. It's a fact. It's not a fantasy. The Apostle Paul documented it in 2 Timothy 1 and 6. Write that scripture down. 2 Timothy 1 and 6. Wherefore, I put you in remembrance that you store up the gift that is in you, which was in you by the putting on of my hand. I remember when I first came to Canada, there was a, a, a person who was not in ministry, but I could just see ministry oozing all over them. So one day we were in the state office and I said to them, you are going to be the next appointed pastor in the church. They laughed and laughed and laughed. I said, what are you laughing at? They said, that is never going to happen. I said, lift up your hand. They lifted up their hand and I blew in their face. They collapsed on the floor. And after about five minutes in the state office, they got up and they said, you know, that never happened to me before. What did you just do? I said, put up your hand again. They said, no, 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 no. I'm not saying that. You, 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 how did you knock me out? And by then, the, the bishop had come around. 
And the bishop asked the person, do you know why I asked you to come here today? They said, no. They said, we have a church and the pastor has left the church and gone to live in America and we want you to pastor the church. They look at me, I look at them. The bishop look at me, the bishop look at them. He said, I just heard this conversation and he and I had no discussion. And that person would invite me every now and then to come to their church. And one day, I, I just know what came over me. I put my hand on them and said, everything I got, you got as of now. And I give them the mic and told them, call people up for prayer and blow in their face. He said, Rev, I don't do that. I, the Lord doesn't use me that way. I say, he's going to use you now in that manner. Do what I tell you to do. And they got the same results. They were shocked. I was shocked. Mm. I was shocked that it happened so easily. I was shocked that it happened so fast. I was shocked that it happened so powerfully. And the last 10 years or so, they have been flowing in that. And I didn't spend much of any time with them. It just seemed like the Lord just wanted me to know that this thing can be transferred. The protege will ultimately receive the mantle of the mentor that they serve. Paul said, I must put you in remembrance. Joshua got what Moses had. There shall not be any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so shall I be with you. I will not fail you. I will not forsake you. Joshua 1 and 5. Come outside. Hey, 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 hey. What was on Moses? Jump on Joshua. Glory adios, man. Mm. The protege must move towards a mentor in their season of uncommon attack and warfare. The picture of David and Samuel's relationship is remarkable. 1 Samuel 19, 18. Write that down. 1 Samuel 19, 18. So David fled and escaped and came to Samuel in Ramah and told him all that Saul had done. During serious attack, David did not withdraw from Samuel. He pursued him. He invested time with him. Don't hide from your mentor when things are going wrong. Let them know because things are going wrong for them and they may be able to sort it out and solve it in a short period of time Then you can solve it. You don't need to go through two months of hell when the mentor can take it off of you in two minutes. They have fought that devil you're fighting now. They have fought that demon that's trying to block you and stop you now. They have fought that devil that's trying to make your financial life difficult now. They have fought that spirit of lack that whenever you have money, people have a story that turns your heart into mush and you give money to people that don't deserve it because they have the ability to draw it from you. Takers will take. Takers will take. And the problem with that is givers will give. And sometimes givers give to takers and takers, once they find that you're a giver, they keep taking all the time. And the mentor has to come in and say, stop. Stop. Or else you'll give yourself to a point of poverty. Final point. The protege will change their own schedule to invest time in the presence of the mentor. They will change the schedule for you. They will rearrange things. All right, I had this thing to do, but if you need me, I will be available. In Galatians 1, 17 and 18, write that down. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again into Damascus. And after three years, I went to Jerusalem to see Peter. And I bowed with him 15 days. This is Paul. He said, I went away to Arabia. I didn't talk to the other apostle guys because they didn't trust me because I was a killer. And when I went to Jerusalem, I went to see Peter. And I stayed with him for 15 days. Two weeks and a day I spent with Peter. Now, you think Peter was expecting Paul to come out of the desert of Arabia and just appear for two, uh, two weeks and a day? No. But Peter knew something, that the Lord was going to use this guy. And so I better reorganize my schedule. Remembering Peter was a married man. He had wife and kids to take care of. And here comes a stranger. And he takes him in and spends 15 days with him. The protege is someone who will discern a respect B, and pursue the answers God has stored in the mentor for their life. God has some answers for your life 
that are stored in the mentor. And the protege is someone who discern. You figure it out. This person can tell me something that I need to know. And I would waste two years seeking and praying and fasting until I get thin like Mahatma Gandhi. But this joker knows something about me. They're not telling me yet. Maybe I have to ask them. The uncommon protege is someone who discern, not only discern, but respects. And thirdly, they pursue the answer that God has stored in the mentor for them. God has answers for your life that are stored up in people that can watch and observe you and can tell what your next move should be and how God is going to use you powerfully, powerfully, powerfully. I see you sitting before senators, governors, prime ministers of countries, and they're firing questions at you through their media person because they want the wisdom of God that's stored in you. They want to hear what God has, what answers God has for the nation. And they want to hear it from you because they have figured out that you're a pure spirit, that you're a pure soul, that you're not here on some hidden agenda, but that you want to see the interests of the country go forward and you want to promote the kingdom agenda. They have figured that out and they want, they will, they will run you down. They will call up your hotel and harass them until they get an audience with you. Your future will be filled with ministers of government, prime ministers, owners of businesses, looking to find you to get solutions to the problems that their company face, that their business face, that their nations face. How can you say that so boldly? I see, I hear, I see, I hear, I see, I hear, I see, I hear. Yes, your life will be characterized by interview after interview by people in high positions of authority, people of clout, billionaires, multi-millionaires, but they want solutions and they discern in you the wisdom of God to give solutions and to solve problems that are baffling them. And you will do it with ease because you're anointed for that. You've got that, you've got that DNA of the genius of God for economic solutions to nations and to business. It's in you. The person that I'm talking to, they know who I'm talking. Glory to God. The mentor has solutions. They have answers. They see your destiny. They see your future. And they, sometimes they laugh. It's like, oh, Lord, you sure? <laughs> but God is not slack concerning his promises. Do yourself a favor and stop being a lone wolf. You need somebody in your life that can see more than you, that can see your blind spot, that can see the future that you don't see yet, that can remove and eradicate all of the pitfalls that will come in front of you. Have a good day, everybody. God bless you. Over to Apostle Gaspar. Amen. 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 Thank you all for joining. The word is working for me this morning. I want to uh, uh, encourage you to go back and listen to this message over and over and over again. This will be the message that will transform and change your life in such a way that you would never, ever imagine, could never imagine the things that God would do. My life, I am what I am today because of mentors. I am here today because of the counsel of Apostle Colin Esibo. I knew him from a youth in my teens. And I'm sitting here as a, a prodigy of Apostle Colin Boom. And he has poured into my life as, 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 as in the last 24 hours, I receive a major, major counsel from him that could have, if it didn't happen, it could have derailed my future. And I give God praise and thanks for him. Also thank God for um, Apostle Jennifer Cherry, who has come, God brought her into my life and it isn't a year yet. Uh, and the things that God has been using her to do is amazing. And so we need people in our lives. It doesn't matter how big and great you get. You need people in your life to touch your life. But more so for those of us who are stepping out and we want to walk on water, 
you better have a Jesus there. You better have somebody who represents God and represents uh, 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 the heart of God for your life, who can tell you, come, come, walk in the water, or tell you how to do it. And so this morning, I want to thank you, Apostle, and honor you for the word that you brought today. It, it, it never gets old for me. It never gets old for me. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. There's a resident anointing on this program right now it's so so heavy so so thick we give god praise thank you all for watching god bless you share this message with your children with your husband your wife your family sit around and listen to, him, to, to it again take care i'll see you Real soon bye. Too. god bless bye-bye everybody yes god bless